Last night's game against the Vikings, <laughs> we barely squeaked away with a win there. Four interceptions by the defense, and not to have that game in control is just – it's obnoxious to me, right? So um, one of the things that's really been bothering me the last two weeks – is the fact that we've gotten seven interceptions in the last two weeks and we've managed to score six points off seven defensive turnovers. Um, good deals bail each other out. We definitely are, are not doing that. You know, our defense is showing up and our offense is laying down flat. If you wanted to beat the Lions, you, you should have capitalized on some of those turnovers. I just started kind of looking through some statistics. I know we talk about statistics all the time and context of statistics and whatnot. So um, I took a large sample size and I, I looked at the times that the Bears did make the playoffs since the year 2000. And one glaring stat kept popping up that I noticed that that seemed to be pretty consistent. And that was point differential. Now, you might say that's obvious. You got to score more points than the other teams score against you, right? I think last year the Vikings were like the first team to ever make the playoffs with uh, negative point differential. In 2001, when the Bears were first in their division and went 13-3, and three, we had plus 135. In 2005, when we went first in the division, we went 11-5. and five. We had plus 58. In 2006, when we went 13-3, and three, first in the division, we were plus 172. In 2010... When we were first in a division, went 11 and 5, plus 48. 2018, when we were first in a division, went 12 and 4, plus 138. And even the time we snuck in in 2020 at 8 and 8, second in the division, we were still plus 2, which isn't a lot. But now you look at the last three years 2021, Nagy's last year, negative 96. 2022, negative 137. This year, we're already at negative 54. This is in my opinion what the overall picture for the coaching staff is you got you guys don't score points you you don't capitalize off defensive turnovers you suck uh, yeah point differential is huge it is and it isn't i mean you can be a you can be a powerhouse uh, point differential team and not be like consistently good week to week because if you blow out one team you know one week and then just squeak by every other week it's it, it'll be uh skewed but i think more to the point of what you've mentioned in that sentence and what i've been saying is there's no identity in the team and there's no bailing each other out when you watch a game like detroit uh last week every single player on the lines just kind of stepped up where the other parts of it kind of lacked and with the Bears right now, it's just everything has to go perfectly, basically, for you to even come close to winning a game, even against bad teams like Minnesota. I I kind of saw this coming from Minnesota, not to this extent. I just didn't think that the job uh, Josh Dobbs like fairy tale could continue and all that stuff. But even with how badly the Vikings offense played and how well the Bears defense played, you barely squeaked it out. Like, why does everything have to go so perfectly for you to kind of win? And what that is, there's just no complimentary football. Like, two things that we always, me and you, kind of believe in, and this is just our tenets of football, is like situational football, and you learn that from, like, Bill Belichick, right? A situational football game with those kinds of things is like, there seem to be no awareness, and it's completely disjointed on offense and defense, where if the defense is doing so well, as an offense and as an offensive coordinator at that point, you need to change what you're doing. You need to change your schemes. You're not doing the screen pass anymore. You're not doing this and that. If you get an interception and the ball's on the 40 and you know that you're just consistently dominating on defense, the situation changes to where we need field goals every single time at the very least. I don't care if it's a deep shot. I don't care if it's a screen for all or nothing, but situationally start calling plays that are different based on where you are in the game and where you are on the field. And yesterday was just this disjointed, weird mess where it just seems like, Luke, go do your thing. I'm going to do my thing. Hopefully it works out at the end. And that's how it feels. And that worked one time for the Bears with Vic Fangio and Matt Nagy. And that was just because it was like an amateur head coach or first-time head coach. And Vic was like a, pro a head coaching candidate. And that kind of can work. But it still needed to be complimentary. And they did that in 2018 where – they ran the hell out of the ball. They did some play action. They scored a few points, and then they let the defense take care of the rest. But right now, this is just – I would like to see some 
communication and cohesion. And I don't know. I think there's a lot of things that still are going to shake out this season where I think a lot of, I think the things we expected to happen are not going to happen. And we may be disappointed. Isn't it crazy that with five minutes to go in the fourth quarter, you had both fan bases sitting there thinking, How, I can't believe we're about to lose this game. Yeah. <laughs> because I, I know my confidence level is very low. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, look at that. The last two drives before the final drive, both ended in fumbles. You know, if you could have just even played a clean fourth quarter, the feeling and the conversation I think would be a lot different. But to just go out there and fumble twice like that was, was very disappointing in my opinion. However – Hey, a win's a win. We needed it. Um, as sloppy as it is, this team needs every single win it can get. So I still like Fields, and I don't think I don't think he's like somehow developed a reputation as a uh, as a not clutch quarterback because I think he's good in those situations. But I heard a stat today that Justin Fields has twenty three fumbles since last season, which leads the league in two seasons since last season. And I don't think of I, him as a I, fumble prone quarterback, but. I believe total in total he's got forty seven touchdowns, thirty eight turnovers or fumbles. That's a that's a crazy ratio that yeah. I didn't expect because it doesn't feel that bad. Um and at the same time, I think at this point it's getting close to where I still don't believe in like clutch statistics in football necessarily, because I think a lot of that is like team based, you know. Um like Fields in one drive basically did, or in two minutes, five minutes, whatever it was, showed exactly who he was, which is why it's frustrating to like know whether or not he's the real deal or not, which is two fumbles back to back. And then an absolutely just dagger game ending dot to DJ Moore. Statistically, it's it's kind of getting interesting because now when I think of like Fields' end of game situations, like I think of Minnesota where Amir Smith Marset messes it up. I think of Washington where he did everything right and then just was a yard short with Darnell Mooney. And then I think of times with like Tampa Bay where this year earlier, like you had the chance to win. And then that was kind of on him or Getzy or both. And then yesterday, which is just a perfect, like nice little mishmash of both. He did everything he needed to. And this time he won. But you could argue that if he didn't make that one pass, he was the reason or one of the big reasons that they lost last night. So I think, you know, as stupid as it is, because I don't agree with it necessarily, but, like, I guess he does have, like, five, six more games as, like, an audition tape and a bye week this week to kind of, like, get his mind right and just – I want to see, like, five weeks of just one of the most dominant quarterbacks in the NFL. And I think it's possible. And I think this team is going to be – like bold prediction. I think they're going to have a top five defense the last like five, six weeks of the season. I think that defense is absolutely rolling. Speaking of the defense, you know, we have another week where look at the guys that came away with interceptions, you know, Jalen Johnson. I know he finally picked one off, but I just want to put in a little side note. All his interceptions this season have come off backup quarterbacks. So just throwing that out there. Um, TJ Edwards comes away with his second interception in two games. He's also leading the team in tackles. He, I think he's leading the league he in is. tackles. Um, you have Jaquan Brisker coming away with an interception. Ryan Poles draft pick. You have Kyler Gordon coming away with an interception. Ryan Poles draft pick. So it looks like a lot of Ryan Poles draft picks the last couple of weeks on defense have actually been showing up um, and, you know, making some big plays. Uh, this defense is second in the rush. However, I believe they're dead last in sacks. Now, mm-hmm. the addition of Mata's sweat in the short couple weeks span that we've had him, he's made a difference. And I thought that there was a chance that his play might go down a little bit since he's going to a situation where the uh, defensive linemen around him are not as good as they were in Washington. However, I think the opposite might be happening to where he, he might be elevating the rest of the defensive line. I was not a huge fan of the Montez Sweat thing and dead wrong. Love it. I'm so glad I was dead wrong because what you see is just, like you said, a guy who's really elevating and uh, just like technically sound. And it's it's kind of interesting because I think he should be your second best defensive like lineman at any given moment to be a really, really good team. And uh, I think that's 
what his future is long term, hopefully. And you know, you draft like some sort of really, really good uh, defensive end or you know, defensive tackle for this team. But man, he's it, it might all be a perfect coincidence, but ever since he got here, you just see a different side of the defense. Um, I think he's a high motor, high energy guy that he makes things look really easy. And that's something that's really hard to do, especially when you're not surrounded by a bunch of other talented guys. But like the rotation, I was really, really watching the defensive line yesterday really hard. It's a good rotation right now. They they really put in Dexter and Billings and uh, Justin uh, Justin Jones, who you for kind of forget is still here. And then rotating a defensive end is really, really good. Um, I think Javon Dexter, and I texted you this mid-game, real deal. I don't think my opinion in that was special in any way. I think I've all I've seen today is just Javon Dexter hype and Javon Dexter um, praise. The guy is figuring it out. And you probably got a really, really good player here. And him coming out at the, at the right time, having his little come out party, and Montez Sweat just kind of figuring it out together can make a huge difference. And as we know, in this type of defense, when you have any type of defensive line pressure, it's going to make your DBs look better. So regardless of it's against backup quarterbacks, you kind of – nowadays, half the league is backup quarterbacks, for being honest. There's half the – there's 10 guys who – don't deserve to be starters in the league or are starters by default. And then the other 10 guys in the league are actual backups because the starters hurt. So you can't really control who you play. And that's fair to say like, it's all against backup quarterbacks who make bad choices. But I think the defensive line is really, really good. If they can keep getting better, which the hope for that is that young guys keep getting better. And this is something we talked about a few weeks ago. The defense is really gelling and everybody's healthy. Um, Hopefully everybody stays healthy. And I think this is like my bold predictions, like top five, top 10 defense for the remainder of the year. When you take a look at the roster, and I know you said this might be a better conversation towards the end of the season, but I just want to kind of bring it up now because like looking at things now, when you take a look at the roster in itself on both sides of the ball, on defense, say you lose Jalen Johnson, right? You may need a corner. You still need a defensive tackle. I think you still need a defensive end. Uh, and you may need a safety to replace Eddie Jackson. Right. However, mm-hmm. I feel like the rest of the positions are at least at least we have average talent, if not better, at the rest of the positions. On offense, I, I feel like you need a center. I feel like, you know, you may need you, you know, you have Braxton Jones at left tackle, but if you get a premier left tackle, that could be an upgrade. And you know, you, you could use a guard too. So you need some pieces on offensive line. However, if you lose Darnell Mooney, you may need, you know, a late round wide receiver. You may need maybe a late round running back. How, but there isn't as many glaring holes on this roster as there was last year and the year before. And I feel like those are all very fixable things going into the offseason between free agency and the draft. I think that's what I think the last thing you said about that was the they feel a lot more fixable. And I think. Last year, when you look at it and you're like, oh, well, you know, you, you're you know, Montgomery and you're, you're the strong, the places that you're strongest in are places you don't want to start looking for, right? You don't want to start looking for two defensive ends and two defensive tackles and two cornerbacks. You at least feel good about one guy where there's two of the, their position out on the field. The linebackers are set for the next five years, you know, three to five years, however long that lasts. The defensive line, I think you going in, you have Billings locked down for two years. You got Sweat locked down for four, and you got Dexter for three. That feels great. Like that feels like one free agent and one good draft pick, and then you have a good defensive line. And then, like you said, with corner and safety, there's only one of those guys at each position. As long as you got Brisker and a decent backup, and then whoever you're taking a free safety. I mean, I don't think there's many elite free safeties in the league anymore, anyway. So. Um, there's a few out there that you can start rattling off, you know, with like uh, Minka Fitzpatrick and Javon Holland and all those guys. But even them, like you don't hear their names every single week getting called like you used to with like Ed Reed and Troy Polamalu and all that. But uh, on offense, same thing. Like you said, it's just less desperate feeling. You have a one number one wide receiver. You have a, a dynamite right tackle. You 
don't really need to worry about running back. I think we're finally one of those teams where it's like it doesn't really matter. Running back shouldn't matter like that. It almost is it almost feels better that you don't have to worry about a Saquon Barkley situation or or uh, uh Travis Henry or anything like that. Like it feels good that you don't have to worry about that with them and Montgomery. So yeah, I think just the roster has a lot more flexibility than it did last year and you know that we said that the one place that we feel comfortable at least not making any major changes is just Ryan Poles. And I think just letting him have like one, maybe two more drafts, then finally giving a verdict. I don't think there's an official verdict on Ryan Poles yet, as there shouldn't be. No GM should have their job critiqued after two years of a rebuild. I think that's insane. Give them at least five years, you know, to see what they do. But so far, so good. Moving forward, I think this is a really not intimidating schedule. And my prediction was that they rattle off three to four games out of six, and they already have one out of six. So let's see what you think, where the wins or where the losses. Lions next week, or uh, the week after. How do you feel about that one overall? not No official prediction, but... I mean, we played them really tough. However, I still think good teams find ways to win. And mm-hmm. I think the Lions have won in many different ways this year. And I think they will continue to do that. Um, yeah, I don't think – I'm not intimidated by them, but I don't think we we win that game. I don't see a two-game winning streak by this team. So I have I predict a win for logical reasons more than emotional reasons. I do think we played them tough. But that team is really struggling right now. They need a break, and they don't have one. They just lost to the Packers. They are absolutely getting – dominated on defense and Jared Goff is a notoriously bad cold weather quarterback. And at that point it's December 10th in Chicago with Jared Goff. I think they'll run the ball obviously, but again, the way the bears are trending and the way the lions are trending, I think the bears are trending just up enough and the lions are trending just down enough to where I think they might split this. So I'm going to say a win. I might reason why, my analysis says, like, win. My gut says 100% we lose. I'm with you. The reason why I'm always kind of down on Jared Goff, and I kind of am a little bit biased for the people that say he's good, because I'm like, nah, he's, he, he's not really that good, is because um, I went to, I believe it was 2018, I think, December 15th. The Rams game? Uh, the Rams night game where it yeah. was like 15 to nine, nothing but field goals. Mm-hmm. And yeah, so, so I saw him at Soldier Field in that cold weather. And yeah, he does not, not play well. He's a California kid. He hates yeah. it. Okay, so I have him 2-0. and oh. I don't necessarily believe what I'm saying, but I, you know, I, that's what I'm going to guess. Okay, then it's we got Cleveland at Cleveland. Um. I love the the meme I sent you that Deshaun Watson did to Cleveland what he could not do to three hundred masseuses. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, that team that team's in shambles. Uh, man, I don't. They're not a bad team. I just don't trust them. I think we have a really good chance of getting a win against the Browns. Okay. That's where I disagree completely. Um, I think Miles Garrett is because just well, I was going to say. Dominate. Based off the history, though, the last couple times we faced them, Miles Garrett has dominated, and the Bears have struggled against them just personnel-wise. Yeah. However, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if they have much to play for, even, and, and you know, especially with the backup quarterback in there and everything like that. I just, I think that that is an opportunity for us. I but, think, yeah. So that's where we uh, differentiate. Again, I think – again, I agree with your logic. I think Browns are a good enough defense to completely shut us down. I think that game is going to be like – honestly, like 13-3, to three, and I think it's going to just be an absolute like sloppy, wet fart of a game from the Bears. And I think it's a perfect way that this coaching staff and this whole season just kind of goes where you beat the Vikings, you feel really good. 
You beat the Lions. You feel great. You beat them at home two in a row. You think you're going to streak and beat the Browns because they got P.J. Walker and a backup quarterback. <clears throat> and then you just come out and you just blow a big wet fart and just ruin that game. And I think that's just the most perfect indicative like kind of way I see the season playing out and making sense. Um, Cardinals at Chicago uh, Christmas Eve. Um, I will take a win there. I think we're better than the Cardinals. I think so too. And I think the one way that Cardinals beat you is Kyler Murray kind of scrambling around. And at that point, I think you can hit him hard enough in the cold weather and kind of shake him, rattle him a little bit. Um, I think it won't be pretty either, but I, I'm going to go with you. So that's two more wins out of five. Bears at – oh, Falcons here on New Year's Eve. Um, We've struggled to beat the Falcons, and I think they're going to win. I think we lose. I agree. I actually, yeah. I agree. I think the Falcons are a pretty good coach team, and I think they've got some skill position players that are good enough. And then to finish the year, you got the Packers at Lambeau. I hate this because I want to beat them so bad, and I don't think no, they're a good they're team. But, yep. but, yeah, they they might be playing for something, actually. They have yep. good enough record to where they're in the hunt for a playoff mix, and if they're playing hard at the end of the year to, to try and get into squeaking the playoffs or wild card game, then I think they'll be a lot more motivated, and they've beaten us before. I think they beat us again. I hate that we agree on this. I agree. Um, I don't think – I think by the end of the season, we probably have a better record than the Packers. I think the Packers are absolutely terrible. Um, and I think that game will basically be for second place in the division. And I think we'll end up being third. And I think the Vikings are going to slide all the way down to the last place. I think after this game, the Vikings are – probably going to be in shambles. I, the Josh Dobbs story had to end eventually. Dude, this is one of the, like, I, I have never been, like, blood boiling like this, where I was, like, so mad about the refereeing and, like, the fixed game shit. He got, he gets driven into the sideline of the Vikings, and then two bench players start dogpiling him and ripping his face mask off. And he gets penalized. Like, watch this. He tries to get out of there. Two more right. bench guys wow. off the Vikings beat the shit out of him, and then he gets penalized. It really felt like the refs had something against us yesterday. I mean, like the comments I... of this are like serious. He goes, Kyler Gordon blocked him out of bounds after Jalen Johnson's interception, and the Vikings receiver couldn't get off a block. So he brought Gordon down by his face mask, started swinging at Gordon, and then Gordon got penalized. Yeah, and threatened to be ejected. Right. That was crazy. 